I want to start by saying that unlike uh, most of you incredible DHers proper here, um, I am actually a DH trespasser, uh, a head I wear um, uh, sometimes with shame and sometimes proudly. Um, and so as a literary scholar and a, 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 a cultural studies scholars working in rights, migration, political ecology, and transmedia storytelling, I am so very humbled by today's a generous invitation to share our ensemble work. Many thanks to our presenters for their painstaking critical work yesterday. It, it's absolutely dazzling. Many thanks, of course, to Kristen Mapes, Ellen Moll, Delaney Atkins for organizing, um, curating logistics. You know, it's such a timely environmental justice centering DH program at the symposium. And of course, many thanks to my tribe of critical humanists, technologists, activists, artists, refugee academics, and students who make unruly storytelling possible wherever we go. And of course, all the love to tech poets and rebels, Nancy Mauro Flood, Ricardo Dominguez, Beth Nowitzki, Rajika, Rajika Gajala, Rup Sirisam, Henry Mensa, Alex Gill, for modeling defiant humanities work and for teaching us as Beyonce sings, how to get into a strategic formation creatively with what Nancy calls the feminist digital paraphernalia of resistance. Today, I'll discuss very intimate and somatic and large scale projects and very ensemble projects they are very site specific. They respond to very local epistemic and narrative needs and they may seem very non replicable in other geopolitical contexts. But they're also I think about something that we care very deeply about here at the symposium. Um, namely, non extractive narrative methods. They're about making unwelcome collective narrative work possible and at the very least. And if we lower the expectations and lower the bar, which we sometimes do in the humanities, they're about efforts not to birth um, what Edward Anguessa Jr. called pathetic tech futures in his vice review uh, of South by Southwest just you know, a couple of days ago. So let's not birth pathetic tech futures. Let that be the model. Of course, my project, or they're not really mine, they're ensemble projects. They're also about coping with loss. They're about immoral budgets. They're about the lack of narrative agency and the heft of doing the unwelcome unpaid work to realign public institutions which should know better with their public interest mission in this neoliberal era of toxicity, permanent crisis, mother of all bombs, supersonic, thermobaric, phosphorus bombs, misogyny, of course, and racism. That is the weather, as Christine Sharper heartbreakingly teaches us. And I hope that tomorrow, I know there is no time today for the Q&A, we will get to talk about this these dimensions of these projects, which oftentimes we are commissioned to talk about as successes, they're also about failures. I'll begin, however, uh, with um, a very personal uh, and spatial political reconnaissance, which I take after Pia Arke, a local post-colonial uh, Greenland landing, Greensla Green landing um, artist theorist, an important um, counter mapping method. Most of you might not know much about my base and Trondheim, where I am, uh, a, a permanent guest of Satami Land is an important character in my journey. Trondheim is a breathtaking port town in the tattering petro welfare state, and it is home to Norwegian, Sami, indigenous and migrant communities, venture capitalists, climate refugees, and Arctic, Mediterranean, and transatlantic border crossers. The city is now transitioning fast and violently into what I call a Silicon Fjord, AKA smart city, the tech capital of Norway. And it did, in that it's also very much like the world in China medieval's weird fiction, the city and the city, a ruptured colonial scene in which the global South and North collide and where there is sensorial awareness of these multiple worlds, but no mutual recognition. Located in the city center, in the city's heart is NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, Norway's largest public research university and a powerful immersive environmental storytelling factory. Lesson number one for me is sadly Althusserian. Most powerful immersive environmental storytelling is institutional VR, ideological and embodied and performed by all of us willing and unwilling perpetrators. Specifically, however, and more practically, NTNU is literally tasked with catering to the nation's industry, industries providing technocratic eco-solution plots with industrial money, supporting what I call baroque narrative research commissions within the research areas of ocean, energy, and digital. As a storyteller researcher here, you're likely to learn the intricacies of industrial narration and adopted subjectivity. You're likely to learn how to speak like an extractive corporation, to see 
like a neo-colonial prospector, and that's a term by Shersin Uhre. We have access to an enormous storytelling apparatus, but we are also trained to follow what I call the rules of aesthetic austerity, because austerity is never just about the money. Um, which dictate the preferred genre, not simply content, of environmental storytelling. Among the most popular are ocean wet dreams, extinction gothic, hydro utopia, ocean crime fiction, marine biomass thriller, moon or earth colonization narrative. No socio of environmental justice epics or manifestos. This re regional immersive storytelling falls under a large blanket of Nordic self-narration, exceptionalist as it is, as one of the happiest, most equitable, environmentally conscious places on earth. It's a soothing story, not completely untrue, but it obscures an active site of indigenous and national conflicts related to land use, reindeer herding, understandings of sustainability, decolonization, gender, and migration, and so on. But, I am not here to talk, take you to Mievel's dystopian abyss, cozy as it is here. Trondheim is also a vibrant polylingual and defiant story space powered by other unruly environmental storytelling ensembles and engines. There is literature for inclusion, literature for utilitarian by uh, Gulabuddin Shukanwar, grassroots improv groups, poetry without borders, uh, the ISAC Research uh, Cultural Center, sorry. Icon International Writers at Risk City of Refuge Network, Translate, led by fabulous uh, Liebe Garcia Zarans, Mankfal Huset, and many more. We also have several well resourced platforms, art platforms, with many of them have an explicit public outreach and new media focus. Uh, Kunsthalle Trondheim on the left is our most frequent collaborator. There's Rosendahl Theater, Fine Arts Museum, Center for Contemporary Arts, Kunstverening, the National Immersive Museum of Popular Music, and many more. And this is sort of like Manhattanic um, uh, infrastructure for a city of under 200,000 people. There's also this very strange space called Adresa Parken, which is an, um, an interactive public tech park with embedded sensors, speakers, and projection screens designed, and I quote it by, by local engineers, as a democratic open arena for new expressions and digital forms of narrative. Located at the world's new extraction and military frontier, Trainheim, in other words, has a uniquely robust storytelling infrastructure. But I mean it also in Simon Abdul Malik's sense that people are infrastructure too. My second institutional or situational lesson it might also be instructive. In academia, we're all dislocated labor, labor migrants, after all, constantly confused about the new place we, we, we land in. So critical environmental storytelling and DH often isn't where you expect it to be. And if critical DH and theory are not in traditional institutional spaces, you have to find D or post-colonial transmedia theory or praxis where it actually happens. This meant moving across disciplinary boundaries for me, away from the humanities, or maybe finding the humanities in industrial design, electronic systems, acoustic ecology, or immersive art. I often joke that sometimes when I need to engineer an escape from the classroom, it actually is a, not a pun. <laughs> Engineers are literally crucial for this sort of insurgent work here. Um, here, for example, you have sometimes um, these uh, practices involve moving from the university altogether to the streets to engage in the kind of you know, Harney and Moten under common storytelling work with residents, migrants, refugees, grandparents for climate change, nature and youth organizations, and so on. Here is a beautiful image of Carl Forby actually doing theory in the streets in front of this incredible uh, neon, Coco Fusco's neon installation saying everything will be taken away. And of course, I always feel that my students prove it wrong. Um, a lot is taken away, but not everything. Um, when I first began experimenting with immersive environments in Norway, it was definitely in resistance to local industrial storytelling, but also out of necessity, uh, in the absence of more formal DH infrastructure. So many analog and digital clandestine practices helped me greatly, in other words, in an environment where more systemic or systematically supported DH work is just not possible. I have also long and secretly worshipped speculative designers, Fiona Raby and Anthony Dunn, Ricardo Dominguez of the Electronic Disturbance Theater and Krzysztof Wodiczko, who poeticize design, reactivate the humanistic performative critical affordances of new media technology. They always already tackle the human machine interaction through the lens of critical theory and art, 
of a literature and performance and engage with ethics, reflection, social critique, and what Aaron Manning calls the speech of the body as foundational components of design, of knowledge making. To me, uh, they, in a sense, led me and my students to reframing computing problems and narrative building blocks as Miriam Posner and Algorithmic Justice League and others are just to do based on local post-colonial uh, indigenous theoretical art practices, say Sami Yoikers and their transhuman non-logocentric storytelling, which my favorite uh, environmental law professor and Yoiker himself and the Sambe says is a, is a form that was banned, quote, because it made spaces for other ways to think. It also means following the maps on the right and the screen uh, crafted by the colonial maps by Cecil Berg in Trondheim or Pia, Pia Arke working in the um, Greenlandic context or following the footsteps of Elsa Laula, a feminist Sami rights icon being guided by Eva Fielens and Sostres Nesuse Radio Kino, radio cinema listening and storytelling project. Moreover, dismayed by the solution-oriented fast industrial storytelling, I wanted to follow these artists, technologists, and designers to bring slow, consoling, meditative, and fleshed, Christina Sharp would say, immersive storytelling by, quote, any media necessary per Jenny Jenkins and crew, in order to unlearn, uh, alongside with my students and refugee academics, what we think about technology, where it's located, what we think about future, public space, solution stories, but also feelings, proximity and touch. Coco Fusco and Erin Manning were, were great influences on this kind of work. And so was Nancy Maulofloud, the critical internet scholar and thinker who conducts, performs the internet and approaches the computer as a theater, not simply as a measure and capture tool. She has taught me a lot about who open up to understandings of technology as a feminist expressive instrument that enables us to touch, to immerse ourselves, to be safe, to linger, and what Olga Tokarczuk would say, to tenderly narrate. Um, so I reasoned after a socialist era artist technologist Antonish, that if technology is a form of art like poetry, can't it also be a gentle presentist tool, so to speak, like a talisman against disintegration? I think Rita Dove, poets Rita Dove and techno-poet Maura Flood would agree. I mentioned resisting aesthetic austerity and of course it needs practice, communities and speakers and listeners, but foremost a change of narrative relations. Carl Powis White insists, for instance, that in indigenous conservation, the focus is never solely on restoring a disappearing species to a particular ecosystem. The focus is on restoring stories and on transforming what Stacey Alimo and Marco Armiero call a toxic wasting relation. How can we rewire our toxic narrative relations? And how can we narrate and create more tender entanglements? It's quite a challenge, but I think a literature or an environmental humanities club or a design lab workshop or a street theater performance uh, or a poetry reading all have a role to play. What we have learned from grassroots storytelling ensembles we've worked with in the city is that we need to first co-curate spaces where we can first and just be together without judgment, play, to play, to linger, to listen to each other, experience non-toxic tender relations and sonic intimacies. Only then can we learn how to arc our environmental plots differently or trust each other or traverse media or leave the classroom and abandon words and narratives and ourselves together and immerse ourselves in ecologies of touch, sound, scent, rhythm, and movement. What I want, in short, when I daydream, is solidarity and queer decolonial tender biopower in, for environmental storytelling. I just to fuse Olga Tokarczuk and Michel Foucault. For this to happen, we need also sites where such tender somatic work is possible. Sometimes we succeed in the classroom, and other times we need to augment this reality. Here you have an image uh, from Kunsthal Trondheim, where, and it has been such an incredibly important place for us for many years, partially because they um, have a specific focus on environmental art and public outreach. And there are images here, you see also images from this month's Somatic of Literature and Public Health class, immersed in the queer and decolonial eco-worlds um, of the sex ecologist exhibit curated by Stephanie Hessler and Katia Aglert of the Seed Book. So it's a both art and kind of environmental humanity scientific project. 
in the image, you see the immersive drifting sound installation on the left by Margaret Pedersen, Anya Thiers' work with Suffer Fruit in Paris and Cameroon uh, on the top left, Alberta Whittle's mixed media work, which now graces the cover of the MIT Press book that has just come out, and Anduk He Jordan's immersive dance with terraqueous microbes, and my students emoting with abandon at the center of these vibrant and contem contemplative eco spaces. Well, some of you may, for some of you, may, uh, this may seem a bit gimmicky. You know, what can an art space field trip do? Uh, we actually prepare very carefully for these encounters for months or more, linking syllabi, reflective activities, prototype design studio workshops, exhibit programming together to make some sense, to make the sensorial practice a sensible practice. We absorb, emote, and contemplate. Um, before the uh, pandemic, so in this other universe, another time, we also collaborated with a new we uh, exhibit, an Eben Kirksey multi-species salon type of living exhibit, co-curated by the Laboratory for Aesthetics and Ecology and Kunsthalle Trondheim. And we paired this exhibit with my environmental literature and humanities class inspired by the arts of living on a damaged planet. And the fingertips of Anat Singh and Madonna Haraway and Octavia Butler were all over it. Um, and this class, I feel, is, is sort of this one experience that keeps on giving, and I mean it, uh, when it comes to shifting how we think about art and ecology and technology. I think that we've done more uh, working with this exhibit that I've done in all of my classes. So take, for example, this beautiful, very delicate um, um, poetic installation called Unknown Giants by Amanda Ackerman and Dan Richter. Uh, it's a book, uh, biosensing poetry installation. Uh, which in which digital technology, as my students would say, make plant make plants speak to them. It's a comment by Vegard Root, and they were literally and metaphorically touched by the way technology kind of operated in this exhibit. They saw finally, or maybe for the first time, algorithms, TV screens, um, as used as narrative, embodied prosthetic creative tools, which quote served as the voice for the plants and gave them the ability to tell stories. End of quote. And also as ears for us humans, as my other uh, participant, Ida Tavik Haugen said, they marveled at how digital tools also enabled them to co-author art in public, to become poetic partners in crime with computers and eucalyptus plants. Very decolonial in a sense and very pre-Cartesian use of technology, I think what was really present in that exhibit. My point is that these simple art-centric um, immersive experiences and reflective activities were not simply evocative in this particular moment. They were incredibly poetically and epistemically generative when it comes to exposing student, students to nor corporate uses of technology. I see traces of these encounters and their papers, in their projects, in their thesis, doctoral applications, in their urban initiatives, and I think also in their own classroom they are now teaching years later. Jacqueline uh, Vermon talks beautifully about working with visceral data. As you can tell, I like working with embodied visceral stuff, especially the present. I see its critical potential. You know, let's not birth pathetic tech futures in environmental storytelling. Let's decouple new immersive media from the futuristic location, links to progress or a particular field or discipline, as if transmodality and immersions were invented, you know, in, in, in London or California and our indigenous colleagues knew nothing about it and poetry had no technology. So my other concern is the kind that, you know, Outcast sings about in Chronomathophobia and Ariella as a lie talks about at great length. You know, this um, persistent urge to futurescape, to abandon the present and reshape the future by mobilizing, but not transforming aff affective uh, relations. I understand that it's quite difficult to embrace and tell multiple times, colonial time, queer time, circadian rhythm, lifespan of different organisms, neoliberal time, the heartbeat and colonialism, they don't go together. Jose Munoz, Michel Bastian, Elaine Gunn uh, and others write beautifully about it. But I just realize, I have realized that the, any resistance to industrial storytelling's military linearity, its precision shooting, its extractive declarativeness, must grapple with different clocks, beats, and rhythms. Paradoxically, for us, and might not work for others in other contexts, reading, reciting poems live, of life, oftentimes without understanding each other's languages, in public, in multiple languages, lingering at the bio art exhibit, or being enveloped in scent, or 
sound at an ambisonic performance allowed us to experience multiple temporalities sensorially, viscerally, and then to attempt to write about it. I want to conclude with um, examples. I want to turn to large urban scale immersive storytelling interventions because between 2015 and 20. 20, we were in a unique position to collaborate with mixed media artists at NTNU as part of the NTNU Art and Technology Task Force, directed very humanely by humanist technologist Andrew Perkis. As part of the Arctic Artistic Residency and Seminar Series, we could actually commission critical media arts projects and invite artists Jody Naliban Hoyun and others to our classrooms, labs, and community centers and to the streets. Current was one of our first Adressa Park and environmental storytelling commissions. It was located in this techno park. And I always call it a, a poignant clock tower of climate change and glaciers disappearance. It was very evocative and very kind of meditative piece. Um, it was also an interactive and poetic art and science public project, which linked temporalities of living and disappearing of melting glaciers and urban flows local weather patterns in Trondheim via sound and visual means. Another uh, installation, uh, another project uh, uh, conducted two years later during the Resistance Forest intervention conceived by Pablo de Soto, an architect and critical cartographer to protest deforestation first in Brazil and then globally. Um, during that intervention, we expanded the public multimedia immersive um, storytelling, again, in this techno park, uh, but also we engage uh, voices and bodies of storytellers, and we try to usurp the, um, the city skyline. I think it's, uh, um, you can see the difference in, in scale. The publicly accessible Adressa Parkin was again our center, and Pablo and I felt that it was, because it was free and open access, it could serve as this liminal university city exhibition and performance space for democratic environmental storytelling, uh, especially with those excluded from extraction um, uh, plotting. Uh, here also, it was a very important uh, projection for us because we the phrase was um, looping and I would, it was translated in 25 languages, but two of them on the bottom are actually local indigenous languages, um, uh, North and South Sami, and they never appeared in such a context on a public building uh, in our city. We also work with words. We use the words of a Brazilian investigative journalist, Eliana Brun, who said, you know, we have to resist like the forest, we have to become the forest, but we also have to lend shape to a feeling, to a political feeling. And we use it as a design metaphor for, for a collective action. Uh, we then materialize it and concretize it in Pablo's medium, architectural and new media, and also words which you could say is my medium, if, if there is any medium that is mine, but also in sound theater and, uh, and with volunteers at an unprecedented lateral, vertical, and sonic urban scale. Ultimately, we augmented our urban chorus performance during the 2019 uh, global climate strike with a 3D projection, which was um, uh, projected on the symphony facade, an immersive soundtrack blending the sounds of, of the Amazon forest, but also local rainforest. And this was playing from the embedded speakers um, in the park. But we also layered over it a flash dance kind of um, session, collective storytelling, and a multilingual poetry open mic, and then concluded with an improv uh, street theater session, all kind of mixed in. What we've realized, uh, I think, during this entire process is that the hardware of the park, you know, the location, the speakers, the, uh, the projections, you know, while glitching their very different way, um, this was an invaluable commons. Uh, but it also, this entire experience made us realize and, and recognize and appreciate what I call the humanware of the city uh, as indispensable, actually prosthetic extension of the technological hardware of storytelling. And I wish there was more time, we don't necessarily have a lot of time to actually unpack some of these images. But I think what's really fascinating, I just wanted to tell you, is that it's perhaps the first and only time when you have actually refugee academic and high powered administrators from the university and designers of the park and uh, migrants and, and senior citizens coming together and being on the same stage. It's completely, it was probably my, my proudest moment as, a, as an educator and scholar. 
Um, as I mentioned before, also all of these ensembles are um, ensemble projects are very collective. And in this particular presentation, I don't have the time to list all of the all of the participants. And I'll be very happy to to kind of direct everybody to write ups of all of these uh, initiatives to get a full kind of uh, list of credits. Um, what I would like to do, I think, just uh, to to conclude. Is just to say that you know there are really great um, institutional signs in the Nordic region within EH. Uh, we have now developed this um, uh, national level um, doctoral EH school consortium that offers um, free of charge education at the doctoral level in EH. There are also incredible environmental humanities centers, greenhouse in Stavanger. Osech and Co-Futures in Oslo, our own EH group at NTNU, uh, and shout out to Julia Lida, who founded it, also centers in Adgar and Stavanger, and of course the most incredible KTH EH lab in Stockholm, led by Marco Armiero of the Occupy Climate Change and Waste to Sin Fame. Uh, they're all springing across the region and changing the kind of environmental storytelling that is possible within institutions, not so much for institutional DH. However, what I want to I maybe leave you with is that even in our sacrificial humanities landscape, radical, uh, you know, Kathleen Fitzpatrick would maybe say insurgent and also talismanic digital and environmental humanities storytelling that extends beyond the necrotic industrial plots that transcends the city university divide and that brings transient and permanent city residents together can and does happen sometimes with poetry and technology used as expressive, ephemeral, and political um, interfaces, but always, really always, with diverse storytelling, storytellers engaged in acts of narrative reciprocity. Thank you. <laughs>